My uh, first trip to Antarctica was in 2001, when I was fortunate to be invited to participate in an expedition to the McMurdo Dry Valleys. At 6,500 square kilometers, the McMurdo Dry Valleys is the largest ice-free, permanently ice-free area on the continent. Now, for me, as a microbial ecologist, this was a really exciting opportunity, because for the last 30-odd years, I've been studying probably the most extreme environments on the planet and the microbial communities that inhabit them, whether it be the deep-sea hydrothermal vents, the hot springs around the world, the tops of active volcanoes, or acid mine drainage sites. And the reason I'm doing this is because I believe that by understanding how bacteria can operate under extreme environments, we're better able to understand how they operate in more complex ones, and you'll see in a moment why. I believe that bacteria are probably the most amazing organisms on the planet. Now, my mom, who's 90 years old, asks me every time that I go see her why, of all the beautiful organisms on the planet, I chose to work on something you can't see. It's something that most people really don't care about. Well, I'm going to give you some reasons why I think these are such great organisms. First off, they've been around for four billion years and have survived multiple extinction events and multiple climate change events. They're the most diverse organisms on the planet. In fact, we have only been able to culture about less than 1% of them. They occupy just about every niche on the planet, whether it be man-made or in the environment, and at the same time, they have this capability of evolving extremely quickly. They evolve by generation times, the record being around about 10 minutes. They're evolving this capability. They have the ability to acquire DNA from the neighboring cell, from the environment, or even from a viral infection, giving them an increased and immediate capability to adapt to an ever-increasing and changing environment around them. They also, in my opinion, are the master biosensors on the planet. The cells are covered with receptors, each able to sense various molecules in the environment, so sensitive that a single molecule can elicit a change or a response. Now that response, if we were able to decipher and decode that response, imagine the power we would have to understand how the environment is operating. I believe that if we could do that, these would become the most essential sen sentinels of environmental change. Now, when I came to the Dry Valleys in 2001, most of, there was 30 years of really productive microbiological research had been conducted out there, but most of that work had been conducted using cultivation approaches. We only really knew what we could grow. And I was bringing something kind of new to the table. 30 years ago, there was a major revolution in technology taking place. Around the world, technology, very powerful technology, was being developed to enable us to unlock the, the, the messages hidden in the DNA code. Now, whilst most of this technology was being directed towards human and human-related diseases, microbial ecologists were looking at the power of these tools that we might be able to apply to be able to understand bacteria in the environment. So when they started to apply these tools, and this is about 25 years ago, what became very apparent was that the diversity of bacteria that we thought was out there, based on these cultivation approaches, had very much underestimated the diversity. So these tools are so powerful that they're now enabling microbial ecologists to better, to answer these two questions, is how do bacteria interact with each other and how do they interact with the environment around them. Four billion years of evolution gives you a huge amount of clout in terms of environmental interaction. If we could get into this and be able to decipher how these organisms are relating to their environment, we would be able to build a capability to be able to sense the environment today and hopefully be able to predict where the environment is going to be going in the future. But to do this, we need a functional ecosystem. You can't pull the ecosystem out of the environment and stick it into the laboratory. It's way too complicated, and you'll change it. So microbial ecologists, of course, wanted, the first thing they wanted to do 
was to move into complex systems. Well, these systems are just way too complicated. The animals and plant diversity, the bacterial diversity, viral and fungal diversity, all piled on top of the chemical and physical environment. It's just way too, too complicated. It's kind of the proverbial forest for the trees. What we were in search of was something way simpler, a place where the complexity of the organisms, of the higher level organisms was removed, and the microbiology would be able to stand up in next to the physical and chemical environment. So this brought us to the dry valleys. Now, as I mentioned, there had been 30 years of research that had been conducted out there, and that work had left us with three beliefs. The first was that the system had low biodiversity. Again, this was using cultivation approaches. The diversity was low because the system is extreme. This is very typical of extreme environments. The selective pressures are so extreme that they, the only organisms that can survive are those that are highly adapted to live there. The second was that everything was everywhere. No matter where you went in the dry valley system, you'd basically grow the same thing. And thirdly, is that because of the temperature in, the, in, the, in Antarctica and in the dry valleys, the low temperature and, and the low availability of liquid water, which is essential for life, these organisms operated very slowly. So I had mentioned before about a 10-minute turnaround time on a generation for the fastest. These guys, if they were lucky, were getting two or three during any given three-month season during the summertime when conditions might be appropriate. So I went into the valley in a tent not dissimilar to this. I went in with a generator and a bunch of equipment, sat on my knees, and my objective was, to, was back in 2001 was to look at the overarching um, higher level complexity of the system. I went in looking for 12 of the 17 higher level groups of bacteria. At the time there were 17, there's around about 60 right now. And I went in with the hope that I might find one that hadn't been grown before. I went in, grabbed some soil, this is in the upper right valley. I grabbed some soil, digested the DNA, shot it into the machine, did the analysis, and all 12 lit up. I said, oh, I contaminated everything, obviously. So I went back, which is very typical of me, and I went back and I did it again, and 12 hit. And then it, we did it again in 12. Three other locations, all 12 lit up. So it became apparent to me that actually, like other places on the planet, we had totally underestimated the diversity of bacteria in the system. So immediately, the questions that came up, an extreme system should be, have low diversity and we don't have that, so why is it so diverse and what is maintaining that diversity? So over the next um, four or five years, a program called the New Zealand Terrestrial Antarctic Biocomplexity Survey began to look at and undertake a landscape scale analysis. It was the most comprehensive landscape scale piece of work ever conducted on the continent. The sole purpose of this was to understand the, di the, the distribution of the biota, including the microbiology, and specifically to test each one of these beliefs. So the first one, belief number one, was this low diversity. So in 2001, I began to see that, but when we did a, a landscape scale study, this entirely proved out to be true. So we have high diversity throughout the Dry Valley system. The second one is everything is everywhere. So on a landscape scale study, we could run these comparisons, and what we found was actually each valley has its own unique diversity, which was totally unexpected. And when we began to look at the system, it appeared as though each of the valleys has their own unique chemistry. And it's the chemistry that's driving the microbiology, but that chemistry is a leftover a fingerprint of the glacial history of each one of these valleys. As we went on and we started to look at the distribution in there, we also found that there was a patchiness to this distribution. And that patchiness is driven by local microclimate. So, and everything is everywhere, actually each valley is unique. Belief number three is about low activity. So the system, for all intents and purposes, these organisms should be operating really slowly. What we did is performed, a, I think, a unique, it's probably the first time that anybody's ever done this, 
experiment where we moved a mummified seal that had been in a location for 450 years and we moved it from that location to a pristine location and we monitored the microbial communities underneath that seal for five years. And what we found was that actually the microbial community completely switched in just two years. We had hoped that we might be able to see some subtle change in five and we saw a complete switch in two. Now, not only did we see a complete switch, but we also saw a loss in biodiversity. The single parameter that governed this change was the availability of liquid water. It marginally went up, but significantly and drove the entire switch in this community. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because the projections for the dry valleys over the next 100 years are to warm. If they warm, there's going to be more glacial meltwater. More glacial meltwater means wider spread wetting of the system. Wider spread wetting of the system will mean that, these, that there's a potential to lose some of the unique biodiversity we have in the system due to these wetting events. So where are we at today? Right now, we've got this amazing system. It's incredibly well characterized. It's a microbiological system being driven solely by the, the abiotic or non-living components, the physical and the chemistry of the system. It's what's driving this. Now, the hope is in the future that the, what we're understanding and in unlocking an understanding of the message that these organisms are relating to their environment, that we will be able to, to develop a better roadmap with which to then move into more complex systems. But does it really matter? Do bacteria really matter? I mean, you can't see them. They don't appear to be doing anything. Well, I think they really do matter. Bacteria underpin are at the basis of every ecosystem on the planet. They are the fundamental keystone organisms that maintain the driving force that brings organic matter back into nutrients, and those nutrients are then fed back into the system. Without them, even a healthy ecosystem, if we pull them out or change them in some way, the failure of the ecosystem is almost certain. So to me, these guys are keystone. Now, some of my ecological colleagues, my ecology colleagues would probably disagree with that word, but I believe that these are the fundamental foundations of most ecosystems. On top of that, they're also our biomediators. These are the guys that come to our aid when we screw up. Many of you will remember the Deepwater Horizon disaster in 2010, when 4.5 million barrels of crude oil was dumped into the Gulf of Mexico. What you probably don't know is that we didn't clean that up. We made kind of an effort. But actually, this mess was cleaned up by a small group of unknown organisms at the time that came to our aid and bloomed in that situation and took care of this problem. Now, the Deepwater disaster in itself, it was, it occurred in a specific time in a specific place. Now, we have a much more an important pending problem in the climate crisis. Many of you will feel almost helpless or even wondering whether your independent actions that you take place every day are having any impact on the climate change. And maybe they're not. However, I believe after 30 years of work, working on the smallest of organisms on the planet, where I've seen them systematically come together and work together to sustainably and scalably alter the environment around them. In 1959, 12 very brave countries got together and decided to protect the fifth largest continent on the planet, Antarctica. Now, they were doing this because of the most certain degree in, of exploitation that might take place in the future. These weren't all big countries. They included Belgium, Chile, Argentina, and Norway, and of course, New Zealand. But what made them powerful was their collective effort, the focus and the passion of, of protecting a continent from almost certain exploitation. 
I believe that if we come together as a global community, if we can have that same passion and that same focus, we can turn around this climate issue. Thank you.